Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. City Movie Thoughts. Okay, so anyone who knows me knows that I love this, and I could fill this entire video just by talking about my favorite moments, so I promise you that that, is, that will not be the case. I will try to talk about some of the interesting elements of this. Because yes, I could pretty much quote this entire movie and I remember every single scene. Anyway, I really like some of the book ending stuff. Not, maybe not the main book ending, I will talk a little bit about that. But first, with Hardigan's story. And I especially like how they cut it so that Hardigan's story opens and ends the film. Again, other than the Josh Hartnett part. Actually, this is like the one time where I actually enjoyed a Josh Hartnett performance, you know. Just, and I've seen the kid in like, yeah, the kid, in like, I don't know, half a dozen films at least. And this is really the one of the only times where he did really well. But anyway, yes, the, you know, once his story's out of the way, we get to Hardigan's story, and then it also ends on Hardigan's story, again, except for the, yeah, the Josh Hartnett, Customer's Always Right, I think that story's called. Anyway, so we have this, you know, because that, that basically means that it both opens and closes on a confrontation between Hardigan and Rourke Jr., and both times we have these few elements that, you know, yeah, that, that appear both times. You know, we have the, you can barely lift that cannon of yours. We have the heart trouble. You know, we have, I take away his weapons, both of them. And, you know, that just, it, it only gets better. You know, the like like the second time, you know, the, the first time it's really strong and you're really enjoying it because you just, as much of a lib as I am, just completely, ble completely bleeding heart liberal as I am, some part of me does enjoy seeing a rapist treated like that. I gotta admit it, you know, is it, Frank Miller really taps into that you know, part deep down inside that a lot of us don't like to admit, but yeah, and it's, and I'm not saying that everybody feels that way about rapists, uh, that, you know, it would be quite that extreme, but personally, I gotta say, just some part of me tingles with joy at the, at the side of that, you know, and yeah, you know, the first time I take away his weapons, he blows his hand up, you know, with the gun, and then he shoots him in the crotch, both of them, and then the second time, I take away his weapons, you know, he just grabs the knife, throws it away, both of them, and he again uses his hand, because, like Rourke said, you can't even lift that cannon of yours, nope, just gonna have to, you know, hands-on work, so, yeah, and, and the bit about, you know, pounding, I, I keep punching him until I'm just pounding wet bones into the, into the floor, you know, just excellent. Yeah, and, and the very final shot, you know, it's, just, it's perfect. You know, and again, f you know, that's the final thing that goes, you know, that, that is there both times. He saves her and closes it with an old man dies, a young girl slash woman lives, fair trade. And the, actually, I think, I love you, Nancy, that, that is maybe only the second time. I'm not, yeah. But yeah, and that, and I really like their relationship as well, how, you know, he's protective of her, but she does have this kind of, you know, she has this kind of warped attraction to her, like, you know, he could be her grandfather, but still, she's, you know, it was the first time that she really looked up, and I mean, that, yeah, the age of 11, you know, she's going to be very impressionable, and that's one of her first, you know, budding puberty that's 
he is her first love, and even after all that time, and even with the massive age difference and all of that, you know, and, you know, he doesn't do it, that's, you know, I think that all three of our leads we can somewhat get behind, even though they do also do things that are you know, really horrible, except maybe Hardigan. I'm not sure Hardigan really does something that you, you know, well, again, maybe not everyone will agree with us treating our rapists. I should talk about, before I forget, the Josh Hartnett book ending, the customer is always right. I have no problem with the opening of the film. I have not read that particular short story. I actually haven't read any of the short stories, I think. I've really only read the three comics that they did in this, and then A Dame to Kill for. Because I thought that was one of them for this. But, yeah, I don't read much. Sorry. Anyway, apparently A Dame to Kill for is in the second one, which is finally actually being filmed, so... Yeah, that's awesome. I, yeah, I'm not gonna spoil anything of that for because I'm not uh, expecting people to, who watch the movie to necessarily have read that particular comic, but is good. It's gonna turn out real well on the silver screen. Yeah. Anyway, the second part, the final, the final moments of the film before it cuts to credits. Apparently this was written for the film. As far as I understand, that did not appear in print. Now, I don't quite remember if it was Miller or Rodriguez who wrote it. But I do have the feeling it was Rodriguez. I could be wrong. But, yeah, I'm not a big fan. Part of it is that it ruins, with the inclusion of the cell phone, it ruins that the entire thing could take place in, like, the 30s. You know, everything else is, like, you know, you've got, well, I, don't, I wouldn't know about the cars, but yeah, you know, or, or at least it didn't, it doesn't need to take place today, it could take place decades ago, at least, is what I'm saying, you know, maybe some of the guns are a bit newer than the 30s, but yeah, well, yeah, they are, anyway. Could take place in, like, the 70s, maybe. And that it's not set in any specific kind of... It might not even be... Heck, for all we know, it's 50 years in the future, but it's just that everything looks so grimy and dirty and old and worn that it looks like it might take place 30 or 40, 40 years ago, you know. But yeah, the cell phone kind of blows that. And then we just have... I don't know, I didn't really feel like we needed his character to uh, return, that I, I don't know, does he have a name? I'm just gonna call him Josh. Again, the way they did in the first scene, perfect, you know, they, one of the few times where Hartnett actually does nail a performance, you know, you really do get the sense, you know, his narration, the way he speaks his lines, the his his eyes, the whole thing, you know, when when he actually shoots her, and the bit about, you know, the silencer makes a whisper of the gunshot. I'll cash her check in the morning. It, it takes a couple of viewings to maybe piece together what exactly happened there. But basically, as far as I understand it, is that she knew she was going to die, the, the woman in red. And she... Yeah, like, like he says, she's ready to face what she has to face. And she maybe didn't want to... You know, it's like taking control of your death kind of thing. And so she personally hired him to kill her. Because that way... She was going to die anyway. That way it was somewhat under her control. And he gave her that experience. You know, she felt loved in her dying moments or something like that. You know, basically... So, and, and it was much less brutal. It was a quick, silent, painless death. And so, yeah, you know. And, I don't know, with Becky... I can't completely tell if it's supposed to be Becky who hired him so that she doesn't have to face the, you know, the horrible death that, you know, the girls of Old Town, the sex workers, might you know, 
dish out on her. And I actually, I don't think that's... I don't remember for sure. It was a while ago. But in the comic, she dies in the shootout, you know. I'm pretty sure that's how it is. And that just kind of makes sense. And it, it, it works. I don't know why they felt that that wasn't good enough for the film. But anyway, yeah, so maybe that's what happened. Maybe she hired him so that she wouldn't have to die in a really horrible way. I don't really... First of all, that really takes away from the uniqueness of the first scene with the red dress woman, you know, that she... And it also just... I don't see them as very similar people. You know, Becky and the woman in the red dress, they seem like very different people. Becky was much more of a, just this, like I said in the review, this completely, you know, naive kid, basically, you know, and I love when Rosario Dawson takes a bite out of her neck, by the way. Anyway, I, I just don't see her coming up with that. And so the other option is somebody else hired him. Why? The girls of Old Town dish out justice their own way. So why would they hire this guy? Or at the very least, wouldn't they hire like someone who would make make it hurt? I mean, she cost them. She she potentially cost them everything. Freaking everything. Why would they would want it to hurt? And I just don't get that implication from the film. Because the first time we see him, he's specifically not making it hurt. You know, if you had to have it end with Becky's, in, you know, imminent demise, send Miho after her. That would have been an awesome way to end it. You know, anyway. And, yeah, I... I love Miho. I love that she never says word. I mean, you know, she doesn't in the comics either, but just... And, and it was perfectly cast. Devon Aoki, I, I hope I pronounced that right. Otherwise, she might chop my head off. Is perfect. She just, she has the eyes. She has that coldness to her that just... She never feels completely out of control of a situation that she's in, but at the same time, you do worry for her. You know, I mean, every single time you find yourself worrying for her afterwards, you're like, why was I worried about her? Of course she's going to be okay. She's, she's freaking Miho, you know. I love the bit with, you know, Dwight's little, you know, down there in the sewers. Deadly little Miho. You'll never even hear... Yeah, uh, you won't even feel it unless she wants you to. He twists the she twists the blade. He feels it. You know, and I love the Irishman as well. You know, the the I don't know, part of it's the accent, but also just the attitudes they have. You know, should I should I take myself a little a wee nap while you're doing all this uh, carving? I'm at the bone, all right. You know, just the yeah, and and the the final the, the last guy. You know, with the. Yeah, the knife, it's me knife I'll do, I'll do you in with. Someone should have told you. Never give an Irishman cause for revenge. Yeah, just, yeah. And the, the bit with the, you know, the bullet. Ah, it's the, the cop's badge. Something stuck in it. It's the bullet! <laughs> and he just gets up and shoots the, yeah. I quite like how, I know it was, it was in the comics as well, but I like how you can figure out the order of these. You know, you see Hardigan's story, you see Marv alive looking at Nancy, you know, as he admitted that he had, you know, when he goes to her place and gets a brew and, you know, leaves Goldie for Nancy to drive home, you know, th that whole thing, and, you know, when Hardigan is at the, the, the Rourke family farm, he sees, you know, or he doesn't see, but we see Kevin sitting there reading the Bible, you know, 
as also, this is one of the few movies where I actually like Elijah Wood. And I swear, it's not just because he gets, you know, cut limb for limb. Honest. And just, you know, details like that. And, and what's her name? The, the parole officer still being alive when, when Hardigan gets out of jail also helps place it, you know. And Dwight is sitting there at the bar in Marv's story, you know. I suppose that is more or less it. Yeah, I think pretty much anything else I'd have to say is just me listing all the stuff I love about the film, and it's much easier for me to just tell you, watch the movie and you'll see what I like. It's, it's pretty much all of it. I don't know if there is a just... Yeah, I, I think at least one of my absolute favorite moments is, well, I love all three story endings, you know. Actually, yeah, I, I should talk just a little bit about that. I love that we actually have two of the three stories. Again, mainstream, well, it's not a mainstream movie, though, but, yeah, you know, people actually still love this movie, and two of the three stories the protagonist dies. You know, you just don't see that that much in mainstream cinema. You don't see that, you know, and it just, and, and it works, because how else would those stories end? That was what Marv, you know, it, yep, actually both of them, Marv and Hardigan, they, they made that decision, you know. Hardigan, the first thing you hear from Hardigan is, I could go home. Maybe I should, but I gotta protect this girl. And and he's just, you know it, it, he even thinks you know I'm thinking about you know what's her name I don't remember the wife's name but yeah you know and the those you know juicy steaks she, she's gonna cook up and all this stuff you know and Marv he's like he could leave it alone but he's not going to you know he will actually go all the way, even if it does mean, uh, you know, his own death. Because, I mean, he could have killed the what is this, archbishop, whatever, the, you know, he could have killed religious work. Yeah, religious work and judicious work. That, that work, that's what they're going to be called here. Powers Booth is fantastic in this, yeah, anyway. And Roger Howe. Gah! Gotta stop talking about how awesome the actors in this are, because yeah, I'll be recording this forever. Yeah, you know, the religious work. He's like, he could have killed him fast if he wanted to get away. But he didn't want to get away. He Or he, he was okay with not getting away. He was like, you know, he actually, he like wakes up and is being operated on, being saved. And he's like, oh, you stupid bastard, you should have... What was it? You should have shot. They should have shot me in the head, and enough times to make sure I was dead, you know. And Hardigan also, you know, he expects to die at the at the start of the story. He's like, you know, yeah, you know, it, it's okay. The backup is here now, and so you know. And then at the end, he's also, you know, the only way I can keep Nancy safe is by committing suicide now, and so he does. You know, because otherwise they'll find him. And I love the you know, Powers Booth seeing his reaction to hearing that the son is now dead. You know, there's, you know. And, yeah, so, yeah, you, you have two out of three endings where the protagonist literally dies. That's now... But yeah, I, I don't know, I think my favorite one, if I absolutely have to choose, my favorite ending and favorite moment is the ending of Yellow Bastard. You know, the, the whole, right, right from the confrontation between Hardigan 
and Rourke Jr. up to him shooting himself in the head. You know, just incredibly effective, you know. Yeah, I suppose that is it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.